Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. And uh, today uh, we are presented with our uh, dear guest, uh, Takbir Fatma, architect Takbir Fatma, uh, in a lecture by the title, Many Minds, Many Hands, Collaborative uh, Authorship uh, from Ideation to Fabrication. I'm your host, Badr al Ghassim, and I would like to welcome our dear guest, Engineer Fatma. First of all, I'd like to thank Artinet for inviting me and for having me for this um, for this series of lectures. And um, I'm really happy to be a part of this. Um, to give you a little bit of a background or introduction about myself, uh, I'm Bagbir Fatima. I'm an architect uh, and I'm the director of Design Aware, which is a, an experimental architecture and interdisciplinary design studio, uh, which is based in Hyderabad as well as in Dubai. Um, and uh, I actually was uh, brought up in Saudi Arabia. So I spent my entire uh, childhood and schooling. Uh, I did from Saudi Arabia, living in different cities, um, including Khobar and uh, the Mom and Yanbu. So these are the places that I lived and I have really fond memories of that. I am actually Indian. So I moved to India uh, to pursue my uh, architectural education, uh, which was a uh, Bachelor of Architecture. Uh, from uh, CSIIT School of Architecture uh, in Sikandrabad in, in the south of India. And then I did my master's at the Architectural Association in London. Uh, and this is actually our final review, this image that you see here. <clears throat> so this is our final um, review at the Design Research Lab at the AA School of Architecture. And that's my team and I, uh, with, and we had the opportunity to present our work in front of many, um, you know, many very well-known and uh, well-respected architects. And you can see um, Patrick Schumacher there in the, in the image. So um, many times we had, you know, whenever we were working in our studio in London, we had uh, a lot of uh, people in the next building uh, asking us, because, because it's a very dense kind of uh, structure and not a, not a university campus. So we had other neighbors. So uh, they used to ask us, hello neighbors, what are you making? And most of the time we used to answer, we're making monkeys because this was kind of an evolutionary uh, way of, of design that we used to uh, follow and we continue to follow. Uh, we do a lot of design that is kind of um, bottom up uh, design process rather than uh, a top down design process. And I'll be speaking a little more about that uh, later. This is our studio um, or both of our studios in Hyderabad, India and in Dubai, uh, in the UAE. We have um, a very small team, but our team is widespread. And, um, and we also, we actually started as a virtual studio and we continue to be virtual um, by connecting with many different minds from all over the world. And we have uh, a lot of collaborations from, uh, with people from all over the world. Um, and today, Design Aware has kind of become an incubator of sorts, which has given rise to many of our members and our former members creating their own um, initiatives under the, under the umbrella of Design Aware, and, or some of them were started at Design Aware and they moved on. So um, these are the current kind of initiatives that Design Aware um, has sort of birthed. Uh, and I'll be talking about them as well in, in detail a little later. What I really believe is that only when you become comfortable with uncertainty, can you innovate and evolve. I strongly believe that because um, when, you're, when you become, there's a lot of um, things that life throws at you and a lot of variables that um, happen during the design process and during the fabrication process. And you can't always know what's gonna happen, but you need to become comfortable with that, with this uncertainty that is always I think constant change is the only constant, right? So uh, you can, you can um, I speak a little more about this in my TEDx talk, which you can see on um, YouTube. And so how do we create constant in this changing sort of variable situation? We always um, have a lot, of, um, uh, a lot of things which are variable, but at the same time, we have things which are constant and um, those are the ones that we try to define. So we just try to define our principles before we start any project. So we have different principles such as um, design access, creating awareness about design, social responsibility, collective authorship, which is also the 
um, the theme of this talk. Experimentation, entrepreneurship, as I mentioned, we're kind of an incubator. Uh, so we try to um, outline and identify our principles before we start any project. And, uh, and then there's the process and the parameters that guide the, re the rest of the project. So these are some of our um, guiding uh, sort of uh, you know, parameters. And then we have uh, a lot of different designs which use uh, or different projects which use them in different permutations and combinations. Design aware, um, as you as you can see from the name, it's kind of a pun. It started as design, you know, with the design of wearables. So we, um, uh, as a student in uh, at the Architectural Association, I uh, used to during the um, during the winter break uh, when everything was closed, there was nowhere to go. I used to uh, spend my time in the in the digital prototyping lab, uh, starting to you know create these wearables. Uh, different kinds of wearables and experimenting with the material essentially. So uh, I designed a whole series of different wearables, uh, bangles, lip rings, etc. <clears throat> and then, um, of course, being an architect, we try to understand what is the making process of each of these things. So it's not just the design, but also how does it get fabricated and how do these things uh, evolve in terms of fabrication and in terms of materiality. Uh, what I really love about this material, uh, which I use uh, and we continue to use in our studio uh, very extensively is the, um, uh, you know, the light uh, sort of the way the light travels through it. So this is fiberglass. So it has this fiber optic quality to it in which you, um, when you just light one edge or one end of, of the material, you, it, the entire uh, object gets lit, which is really interesting. And so we applied it to many different things, not just wearables. So whenever we design anything, we do it in a sort of series. Uh, and being an interdisciplinary design studio, we uh, design everything from wearables to architecture, to urbanism, uh, installations, lighting, furniture, et cetera. So these are some of our um, sort of lifestyle accessories. We uh, designed along with a few of our interns um, who, who also come from many different backgrounds. So. Uh, this we call the sunlight, and then um, the one on the right is a uh, is a uh, business card holder. So you can see how the light travels and sort of lights and makes the edges glow. And so uh, many years later, in Design Aware, we were asked to uh, design a uh, sort of um, uh, a kiosk for uh, Rajiv Gandhi International Airport in Hyderabad. And, uh, and in this, we uh, took um, inspiration from the different landing and takeoff paths of flights, and we use the same material. So we proposed this, it's, it's not been built, but we proposed this as a, a business center where you could check your email or you could uh, make a phone call. Um, and the entire object is more of a, it's more like a sculptural object rather than a space. So um, it has this kind of, um, x-ray quality to it where all of the edges get lit in this blue light and you would be able to see it when you were walking from a distance. And so that's how the material sort of um, adapts itself to different scales and different um, uses. And so speaking of which, we have different materials which we use, uh, which are, you know, which, which adapt themselves to uh, different situations. So we have this material, which we started to experiment with. Initially, we experimented with um, straws so drinking straws plastic bendable drinking straws and then we translated that so we begin with this kind of um, representative material which has similar geometry to it like lines and then we translated that into uh, metal um, you know metal members so metal rods in this case and so we have a whole series of different explorations in that and later you know so years later we revisit something that we we did before so um, many years later, when we were asked to uh, design an ice cream parlor uh, for this homegrown brand in Hyderabad called Melting Moments, we returned to one of our earlier explorations with the lines and we created this feature wall and a lot of other things, you know, in other places as in the, uh, in the seating as well, you can see that it's being repeated. So we have this feature wall, which was designed using the same um, concept of lines and it's a very small space. Uh, and this is a design and build project for us. So we we designed uh, as well as did the um, did the execution of this project. So you can see the evolution of that. 
And another material we find really um, interesting and it still, still excites us quite a lot. Uh, I've also been trained in tailoring. Um, and, uh, and this is something that um, uh, my mother is really, uh, you know, really interested in and, and really skilled at, uh, as was my grandmother. So these are things that, that have been kind of carried forward uh, through generations. So uh, when I learned tailoring, I never thought that I would be applying it during a master's in architecture program. But uh, that's exactly what happened. So this is um, a canopy that we designed uh, at the DRL, the Design Research Lab, uh, where we used um, four-way stretch lycra, which is the, the white material, the fabric that you see, uh, combined with um, these rigid members. So this essentially, this becomes um, a, a tensegrity system in which the soft material, which is um, the fabric, is actually the structural material and the rigid members are non-structural. So if you were to snip the fabric at any point in the system, the entire system would collapse. So that was kind of an interesting um, exploration for us and the way that light filters through is also quite interesting to note. Um, and these are some further explorations. And of course, much, much later uh, in Design Aware, we were asked to design a mosque in, um, in two parking spaces. Uh, of a really old uh, existing residential building. So we had the space of two parking, um, two, two car parking spaces or garages. And <clears throat> within that space, we had to design a really small mosque. And um, this was for residents of the building who were elderly and who could not go, uh, you know, walk to the mosque uh, every day, especially during the Taraweeh prayers um, in Ramadan. So as Ramadan was approaching, um, the client asked us to design this mosque and, and this was a, a pro bono uh, project. And, uh, and so we, we were actually uh, given only 10 days to uh, you know, execute this project. So the entire project was done in uh, about 15 days from design to execution. And what we did was we kept the entire uh, mosque designed very minimalistic and very uh, subdued but we created this uh, feature wall made of fabric. And, um, and the, the frame is made of uh, metal and you have the fabric which is mounted on top of the metal. And this is, uh, for this we used, uh, again, we used four-way stretch lycra, but we mainly the expertise that we used was of upholsterers or sofa makers. So the, the stitches and the, the, the tucks that they use for sofa making, they applied it to architecture. And this is the, a little bit of a um, time lapse showing how it was built and the entire project was done uh, within two weeks, just in time for Ramadan. And uh, as you can see, everything is really minimalistic um, except for the wall. And so this was the, uh, the, prayer, the first Tarawi prayer that happened in the mosque. And, uh, and that's a really small space. You can see the two parking spaces, you can probably make it out. And, uh, and light plays a really pivotal role, I think in every design, but also in this particular um, project as well. So um, again, taking fabric into consideration, we, we like to explore with fabric a lot. So this is um, a seat that we designed, which is, uh, we call it uh, the hexa. And so this is based on an origami uh, design, which is a hexa flexagon, which can infinitely rotate. So this is something that uh, is kind of a prototype that we created. So we believe that many minds and many hands can come together to create something that is much greater than the sum of its individual parts. And with this premise, uh, there is a workshop called the Fractals Workshop that I teach in person as well as online. Uh, and this has been uh, kind of evolving from uh, around 2011 uh, is when I started it. This is one of the versions of the workshop where I used, um, you know, uh, we used uh, um, natural material. So this is cane, which is readily available uh, in, uh, in India. And on the right side, the three images that you see on the right here are uh, different workshops where we use bamboo. So we use bamboo skewers as representative material. And we also use um, the middle image that you can see. Uh, this is in the UAE where we involve Bedouin craftswomen and we used arish, which is the um, date palm, uh, dried date palm uh, midrib, as well as the leaves. 
So th those uh, were used and we learned from them and we applied them. So in this series of workshops, we have um, the method which I was talking about, which is the bottom up method of learning. Just like in nature, everything in nature is, you know, nothing is random in nature. Everything has a certain pattern, a certain rule set to it. So um, we learn from nature and in particular from fractals and apply it to design and apply and try to create uh, more patterns which the students themselves create different um, sort of, uh, you know, different rules of execution or rules of application, which are, um, which we call analog algorithms, because um, in some of these workshops, we don't even use a computer. We, everything is done by hand and aggregated it together. And it's not random, but done based on a set of rules that the students develop themselves. And so this is, these are some of the examples of uh, design and build, build workshops where we um, sort of um, uh, scaled up with the same material. So before I was talking about bamboo skewers and in this we have, there is no single mind. So design uh, we believe is no longer the product of a single mind. So the, the idea of a master architect or master designer who creates everything, uh, I think that's quite um, misleading because there's always a very big team that comes together and everybody's skills um, sort of contribute to the final outcome uh, and throughout the process. So uh, during the design process, as you've seen earlier, we have a whole uh, class of students who participated in the designs. And then we selected some of these designs and we have uh, some of them blown up to a larger scale. So in this particular image, you can see the bamboo worker who is teaching us how to use bamboo, how to uh, manipulate bamboo. And bamboo is a really versatile and a really strong material. So we did about eight different pavilions uh, in the south of India in Velour. Uh, Velour Institute of Technology was the host. And then we had the opportunity to use a different material, which is Arish, for Dubai Design Week in 2018. And uh, we created this sculpture called the Weavex, which is um, the first in a series of installations using Arish. Uh, and it's a doubly curved mathematical surface. Uh, and similarly, in India, we used cane. So in 2019, we participated in Hyderabad Design Week along with the World Design Assembly. And here we were commissioned to design uh, a series of sculptures or installations all over the city. So we used cane, which is the local material, which is usually used for furniture. And we saw that um, furniture makers, they design really complex curvatures and really complex geometries and interesting results. So we were able to take their help for the fabrication of this series of sculptures. So this is a whole series from Dubai to Hyderabad where we had, you know, Vivex 1 and uh, Vivex 2. Uh, and we have uh, in Dubai, the Vivex sits at uh, Dubai uh, Design District. And in Hyderabad, uh, we had temporary installations in different parts of the city. <clears throat> That's our team um, with the Vivex uh, at Dubai Design District. And, uh, and of course, Along with the team, I think what's really important along with the design team is the people that we learn from. So where does this technology, um, and, and it is technology, it's just uh, a very ancient kind of technology. So where do we uh, learn about how to manipulate and how to use this material? So we, we turn to, um, as I mentioned, the, the, the bamboo workers uh, in, in Velour, uh, and we turn to the Bedouin craftswomen, who are actually who are the ones who have the expertise to build houses which used to be built with Arish uh, in the olden days. So we now they're doing things like crafts and basket weaving and we learn their uh, techniques from them and apply them to the sculpture. And, um, and thirdly, the, the furniture makers um, in Cain. So those are the people that we learn from. So it's a more of a collaborative uh, effort and a collective authorship rather than um, you know, just, just the idea of a single mind. This was another, this is another example of collective authorship. Um, so here we were asked to design, this was for Street Nights uh, Art Festival in Dubai, uh, where we were asked to design a public art installation that would be built, designed and built by the public. So how do you get people who are, you know, from all walks of life, who are just visiting this festival, uh, just as, as uh, casual visitors, who don't have a design background and who are definitely they're not all of them are architects so they're 
of all age groups and all different backgrounds, how do you get all of them to come together to build an installation or even design an installation on their own without really giving a sort of intensive instruction, uh, instructional or training um, sessions. So what we did was we designed this basic unit, which is just a flat piece, which has grooves in it, uh, which is laser cut out of MDF. And it can interlock into each other to become from go from 2D to 3D. So it becomes a 3D aggregation. And you can see that, you know, little kids and, and their fathers and, and anybody uh, can come together and uh, build this installation. And the previous one was at Street Nights uh, Dubai, which was done over a period of 10 days and 10 nights. And this one was done, uh, the one that you see on your screen now, which is uh, at Wade in New Delhi, just, the, um, just earlier this month. Um, and this was done in two days. And uh, it was built by people from all different um, you know, walks of life and all different backgrounds and age groups who would just come and sort of um, add a few of these pieces and then it grows organically by itself. So rather than thinking about the outcome already, you're not thinking about what it would look like at the end because that is completely difficult um, or impossible to predict. So it's completely unpredictable and, uh, and unknown because there are so many minds and so many hands that are coming together to work on this and put this together. So every person who has added uh, a unit or a part of it to this uh, has participated and collectively authored it. And so they can claim ownership to the design, to the final design. So it's kind of a collaborative effort that has gone on. Um, we found this, this uh, sort of interlocking, you know, idea really interesting. So we started to, um, sort of translated into different materials. This is from a workshop, uh, one of the fractals design and build workshops uh, that we did, uh, I think uh, last year in Kerala in the South of India. And, uh, and this is done by students of um, different design disciplines, not architecture, but um, product design. And, um, and I think there were fashion design, lifestyle design students, as well as interior design students. And then they scaled it up in a different material. So remember what I was saying about different materials, representative materials and real materials. So when you scale it up, it's a different material altogether. Um, and then, you know, the interlocking sort of gives it that three dimensionality. And so these are some of the explorations they selected about three of them for a large, larger scale installation. So design uh, was also collective and fabrication was collective as well because they worked in teams. And uh, uh, what I'd like to mention here is that we also had a collective jury in which you know, we were able to invite during the, I think during the pandemic and during the lockdowns, we were able to connect with people from all over the world. And these are people we don't, most of them we don't know in person. So we only um, got acquainted with them online during, uh, during the last couple of years. And then we invited them to participate in this hybrid jury because we found the fact that uh, we're able to connect with people from everywhere in the world, we shouldn't lose this um, sort of resource that we, we were able to tap into the last couple of years. Um, so this was a mid process jury in which students got uh, inputs from people from the US, uh, Italy, Germany, UAE, and Spain, uh, as well as us, of course. And so we had all of these people come together and, uh, and sort of give their inputs to the students, even though it was an in person workshop. So usually, uh, this is how it works. The I think this is stuck, but anyway, this is how um, the, the entire uh, workshop sort of comes together where in this large hall, you have many people um, working together, collectively authoring these installations. And then at the end of it, we have an exhibition of the work. Um, and similarly for uh, Hyderabad Design Week, we were asked to do this permanent installation uh, for Hyderabad where uh, students designed the uh, installation. So they, again, use the fractals uh, sort of principles of going from the bottom up and working together uh, collaboratively. And then later, uh, students who were designers collaborated with the, with the fabricators. So the fabricators have uh, a different set of skills and a different uh, level of expertise. And so the students were able to learn from them and the fabricators also learned from uh, the designers. And so we have this installation, which we call the Peacock, uh, because it evolved to sort of look like a peacock. Um, and this is located uh, in front of the uh, Telangana State Assembly. 
<clears throat> in Hyderabad. And this is made of metal. And the Fractals Workshop uh, has been featured um, on the cover of Surfaces Reporter magazine um, in, the, in the past. Uh, and because uh, of the lockdown, we started to translate the workshop into an online model as well. So before, you know, how do you, how do you get this workshop, which is so hands-on and so material driven, how do you, you know, get it to uh, work online? And uh, we were a little skeptical, but it, it was a very, um, I think a positive uh, sort of outcome where um, participants were sitting at home and they were, you know, uh, working on their material, whatever they had at hand. Usually we use paper because that's the most readily available even during a lockdown. Uh, and then they translated these uh, designs into, um, you know, digital models. Uh, and then what we did after that was, I think I'm having a little technical problem here. Right, so it says it's not responding. Here we are. So we translated this into um, a VR space. And uh, these are some of the explorations. So instead of doing a hands-on uh, sort of physical exhibition, we had a virtual reality exhibition and maybe we can put the link to that exhibition in the um, in the comments, probably, uh, when we share this video. I think um, kind of stuck. Uh, yes, uh, it started working now. It looks like it's working on my screen. Um, architect to create. Can you hear me? Um, I'm not able to hear you, uh, but there, I think something's wrong with my computer. Yes, uh, maybe you can try to force quit from Rhino. So click on the uh, taskbar. I'm, I'm not able to hear you, I'm sorry. Yes, can you, can you uh, hear me? I can just hear some noise, but I can't hear the I can't hear the words. Hello. Yes, hello. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you now. Okay. Uh, the, is the presentation working, or do you want to maybe restart? Um, I think I might have to. Um, I might have to restart the the file. Yes, please. And uh, if did you open up uh, Rhino like that file? I'm sorry. Did you open up the Rhino file? Did you run Rhino? Oh, no, no, no. It's just a, it's just an image. Okay, then maybe you can just reset the file. Let's yeah, see how. Yeah, let that. me just. Uh, yeah, let me close the presentation and reopen it. Hopefully sure. It Take your time. <clears throat> Can you hear me? Yes, indeed. All right. Yeah, um, I think. I can share it now. Sure. <clears throat> Sorry about that. Totally fine. 
So um, as I said, we translated these models into virtual reality. And um, so this is a, a sort of fly through of the virtual reality space uh, that we created collectively. Um, and because there is no scale, there's no uh, gravity involved, um, it, it becomes a really surrealistic kind of space. And that's, um, again, the creation of many uh, people coming together and sort of contributing to it. And so we, we sort of set it up as a virtual exhibition um, in the metaverse. And as I said, we'll, we'll share the link for this. I think anyone can enter that space because it's a perpetual exhibition that anyone um, can access at any time. And that was our goal for this. So these are some of the renditions that they did, uh, that some of the students or participants did. Um, this is another really interesting one where you know material was applied. Um, because there is no scale, you, you kind of get the sense of um, scaling up or scaling down and being able to um, sort of go through, go through the models themselves. So this is another, um, you know, this is an architecture project that I'd like to share because, uh, you know, we're talking a, little, a lot about um, sort of concepts and, and um, virtual reality but also in reality, we apply similar principles as well. And we find it really possible to do that. So this is um, this was a really skewed um, site uh, in which um, we had to maximize the floor area as much as possible. So we created the stepped kind of structure for this building, which is a residence. Um, and what's really interesting is that we created this dynamic facade, which would be, uh, which, which is created uh, using louvers um, which would turn at different angles. <clears throat> and some of these uh, would be static, whereas some of these would be able to open and close at different angles. Uh, and so that makes it a more uh, dynamic facade, which is data driven. So a lot of uh, the designs uh, that we, you know, the, the process that we try to follow in design is uh, data driven design in that we have uh, a set of data um, or, or a set of parameters that guide the design itself. So it's never really random, but we um, look at what are the different, for example, in this one, what are the different uh, spaces that are going to be behind this, um, this sort of uh, facade? Uh, it's almost like curtains which are opening and closing. And so the spaces that require more uh, privacy would be the ones that would open the least and the spaces that uh, can be open the most would have uh, the most angle of opening. So that was the idea uh, behind this facade. And so, as you can see, some of these parts, um, it's, it's like a nine square grid and some of these open and some of them close, depending on the time of day and um, the, the level of privacy that you require. And this is uh, under construction. And on the other hand, so the previous one um, was kind of a larger res residence. Uh, on the other hand, we have this really, really tiny residence that uh, I'd like to really talk about because uh, it was a really, um, you know, small site of about six meters by 16 or 17 meters. And, um, and on three sides, it's share, it shares walls with the neighboring buildings. But uh, there were existing two um, neem trees on the site, and we wanted to really preserve those trees, and we didn't want to cut down the trees. So our design process uh, uses many different uh, methods and materials and, and ways of visualizing the design. It's, um, <clears throat> for example, you know, uh, these cut, it, cut out spaces, which are color coded at the same time using, uh, you know, building blocks, uh, also sketching and, you, and making uh, physical models at different scales to understand the level of detail. And so this is how the design um, turned out. We created a courtyard around the existing trees. Um, and as I mentioned, all three sides of the building except the front are uh, shared, uh, we share walls with three different neighbors. So there was no opportunity for ventilation um, on any of the edges. And, and we couldn't really set back from the, uh, or, or leave any setbacks around the building because it was so tiny 
So the footprint itself was really of uh, great value. But at the same time, we uh, have to value ventilation and, um, and air circulation and um, daylighting as well. So here we created this courtyard. And as I had mentioned at the beginning, we always outline our principles before we start any project. So in this project, uh, our principles were one, uh, to preserve the, the existing trees, but also to create maximum um, natural ventilation and daylight to kind of enter the building. So this is um, how we were able to solve that problem. And in the, in the front also, we created a small garden. Uh, apart from architecture, we uh, did the interior design of this project as well. And we also uh, did the, the construction of this project. So uh, the, the context is really interesting to note. It is located uh, near the Qutub Shahi tombs, which are a 17th century mausoleum complex in Hyderabad. And, uh, and so this has uh, mausoleums um, dedicated to uh, you know, the, the previous rulers or the previous dynasty that founded Hyderabad. So we also, whenever we're designing anything, we wanna pay respect to the existing heritage, wh whether it's built or natural. Um, and so this is, this is actually um, kind of derived from the jali or screen uh, concept, which was existing in traditional architecture, also known as Mashrabiya uh, in Saudi Arabia. So we, we wanted to create this kind of perforated facade, which would let in light and, and cool air, but also give privacy to the, to the residents. And so this is under construction. And um, this was our sort of our uh, collaborative effort in which we did the design as well as the, the construction of the building. This is actually, this is the current status of this project. Um, yeah, I think this one will give you a really a good idea of how that um, location is. It's very close to these tombs, um, the Qutb Shahi tombs. There, uh, I think uh, uh, there are over 30 tombs. I'm not sure how many there are, uh, but they, but you have a beautiful view of these tombs uh, from the top of the of the building. So it's really in close proximity, and then you can see the density of the residential buildings that are there. <clears throat> I'll fly quickly. So yes, you can see that all of these buildings share walls with their neighbors. So they're really small houses and uh, all of the walls are pretty much shared. And this is our project, which is under construction. So it creates these light wells in the middle. So this is another, almost like an elevator view, um, which shows the different floors through the courtyard. And I think the ending is quite interesting to, to see. So here at the, in the background, you can see the Qutb Shahi tombs. And beyond that is the Golconda fort, which I'm gonna talk about a little more. So we started this, um, you know, uh, initiative under Design Aware or in partnership with Design Aware, which is our construction initiative. It's like a sister company called Build Aware. Uh, we started this in order to uh, gain more control over the, the execution and fabrication processes rather than um, you know, outsourcing those processes because a lot of our designs are quite um, experimental. It's difficult to uh, find standardized um, methods of fabrication and construction. And so we sort of claimed uh, this process as our own and we started to um, you know, execute some, of the, some selected projects. Uh, and also um, my father uh, has lived in, and worked in Saudi Arabia for uh, over 30 years in um, many different cities all over Saudi Arabia. So we have his expertise uh, guiding us in Buildaware as well. Uh, and every time we do any sort of uh, new initiative, we also like to do, um, to, to have an accompanying academic initiative with that. So along with Buildaware, we have an academic program called Studio to Site, which takes students um, and young professionals to our construction sites, because in college, there's very, very little uh, opportunity for students to visit the construction site uh, and learn uh, directly from the construction site in a hands-on manner. 
So during our um, construction process in parallel, we run this long-term program in which students of architecture, design and engineering can uh, visit the site uh, and see the different stages of work that we are doing uh, on our projects. And they can learn from the expertise of uh, not just of the architect and designers, but also engineers and masons and other people who are involved in the construction process. And this is the, the last project that I would like to share. Um, I think if you know Design Aware, you are probably uh, very familiar with this project, which is the design of a charity school uh, inside the Golconda Fort in Hyderabad. So this is the, the Golconda Fort, which is more than 800 years old. Um, it was built by uh, uh, one of the dynasties that ruled Hyderabad and then subsequently expanded by other dynasties. And I love this image because it has our built heritage as well as our natural heritage in one image. So you can see, you know, both, both of the heritage uh, that we are trying to preserve in this image. And the school site is located right inside the fort. So you can see here um, the, the outer walls of the fort. And this is the site that we were given for the, for the school. And it's a charity school. Um, so it is run entirely by charitable funds. And so this is how it looks uh, now. The school kind of nestles itself into this really uh, high density, low rise uh, urban residential context. So you have um, whatever area you see on the left, lower left side of this image, that is really steep, unbuildable slope because it's really, it's on top of a mountain. And you have um, the, the flatter parts are kind of built with these really dense houses which are packed together. And our school uh, site is also right in the middle of that. So this was initially, um, I think this was from back in 2014, how it looked from um, the, the satellite image, uh, Google Earth. Uh, so you can see that the site is divided into three parts. Uh, there was an existing hall with partitions in it. Because it's a charity school, it was, it was just um, being run in a really informal manner. It didn't really have a school building. There was an existing mosque on the site and uh, a playground with this dotted line being a retaining wall. So uh, because this site is, uh, there is a cliff that runs through the site. So the site is divided into two different levels, about six and a half uh, meters of difference between the two levels. So the upper level was filled uh, and made into this flat space, which was uh, being used as a playground. And then the, the owner or the client acquired um, the, the rest of these spaces. So you have this lower uh, site and then you have this tiny uh, site, which is which used to be an old courtyard house uh, with, again, which has shared walls with the neighboring houses. So this is the challenge that we were facing uh, when we started to work on this project. So you can see that this is how the site is. It's a, it's a really difficult terrain. That's me <clears throat> standing on the lower uh, level of the site. And then on the left side, you see this um, rock, which is sheet rock, it's not boulders. So, um, and, and this is uh, made of granite. Granite is the rock that we um, locally get here in Telangana and Hyderabad. So uh, the rock is uh, over 250 million years old. And this is our natural heritage, which we need to preserve. Uh, apart from that, um, you know, th these are not movable boulders. So Boulders are rocks which you can maybe use a crane and you can relocate them, but this is sheet rock which forms part of the terrain. So it forms part of the earth and it's not movable unless you break it or blast it. And that was not uh, something that we recommended to do. So that's the, the cliff that you can see. Uh, there's about two floors of difference um, between the lower uh, ground, we call it the lower ground, the middle ground and the upper ground. So this is from the upper level, you can see the Golconda Fort. Everywhere you turn, you will see the fort around you because you're inside the fort. Um, and there was this, you know, a large shed, which was a, the existing school building and an existing mosque, which was designed uh, by our client much before we were, we were involved with this project. So when it comes to starting the project, you're starting with outlining the principles, right? So what are the principles and what are the parameters that were um, not variable that were constant. So one thing was um, on the left, you can see the context. It's a really uh, sort of kitschy and very, very dense um, residential context, low income group. Um, and you see a lot of goats uh, roaming around this area. 
Um, the rock that was existing was something that we wanted to preserve. That was one of the principles. Um, and these, these children who were coming to the school um, were all residents of Golconda who were living uh, in and around the port area. And so their houses themselves are nestled among the rocks. So they're really used to this rugged um, topography and they uh, are used to climbing the rocks. And so that was something that we wanted to uh, incorporate into the school. At the same time, we saw that, you know, before the school was built and it was just an informal uh, setup, we saw that a lot of teachers and children were learning under the trees. And, and this is the Indian traditional system of learning where we sit under trees to learn. And so there were a lot of trees on site, which we uh, truly wanted to preserve. Not only that, but we wanted to preserve this characteristic of learning under the tree. It was a very, very difficult site. Um, so we had to incorporate many different methods of um, measuring the levels and understanding the, the terrain and the topography. So we created extensive, we, we did extensive um, uh, geological surveys and land surveys to understand the contours. And yet it was quite difficult because uh, during excavation, there was more rock which was hidden underneath, which is difficult to uh, map out. Hopefully, you know, in the near future, we come up with a uh, certain technology which will allow us to do that. <clears throat> so we did a lot of uh, physical models. And then we, uh, this is how the school situates itself in, uh, in this really tight neighborhood. So you have one entrance from what used to be the existing courtyard house, which is the lower entrance. We call it the lower ground. And then you have this upper entrance from the playground, which was filled up. So um, this is about six feet, six meters of difference, six and a half meters of difference uh, between one and the other. So you can enter from the ground floor and you can enter from the second floor as well. Our aim, another you know, of our uh, principles and aims was to preserve the playground. So it would have been really easy for us to build over the flat part of the site, which was the playground. Uh, but we decided to build on the rocky part of the site, which was much more challenging and much more difficult because we wanted to retain this playground as a lung space, which is really rare for urban schools, especially uh, you know tight urban schools in, in big cities. Um, a lot of them are using the, the rooftop as a playground because they don't have a ground. So we wanted to preserve the playground and we shifted the entire uh, built up space to the, to the rocky cliff, cliff part of the site. So that's uh, how it situates itself. So we have that playground preserved and we have uh, all of the school on um, the lower and the, the middle part of the site. So just to simplify, we have lower ground, middle ground and upper ground. And, uh, and the gray uh, you know, mass that you see is the rock. Of course, it's not that size. It's, it's kind of uh, continues onwards, but uh, that's where the rock is coming in. So on the lower ground, because the rock is coming into the building, we had to um, reduce the footprint of the building. The middle ground, we were able to have a larger footprint and the upper ground, we intentionally kept the footprint small in order to have uh, better views and, and more open space. So this is the entrance to the school, um, a really narrow um, sort of you know, uh, space that pays homage to the existing courtyard house. So all of these houses have the same proportion in that lane. And so when you enter, uh, you know, first of all, the, the school building itself also has the same scale. But when you enter, you have this cutout, uh, which allows for natural ventilation and sunlight to stream into the heart of the building. Um, because we wanted to pay homage to the courtyard house, but also uh, there was no other way of ventilating this building because it has shared walls, again, on either side. So we could not have windows on either side. So we decided to create ventilation opportunities from the top, just like a courtyard or an atrium. This was the existing courtyard house before. So you can see that um, you have this open uh, space on top, which brings in sunlight. And, um, and this is seen from the other side. Uh, a lot of the, the design and you know, design process, we were not able to design the entire building before going on site. So ideally you should finish the design process before you start construction. But with this project, there was a lot of overlap. And this was a participatory design process in which we took inputs from the students, the teachers um, of the school, but also we observed the students and the, and the users um, using the building. And then we changed the design or we evolved the design in response to the, to the user behavior. So um, 
for example, what you can see on the left side is, you know, we're just sketching directly on the walls and the rock just to explain to the, to the team that's doing the execution because this was not a highly trained uh, execution team. So this was a team which was kind of an, uh, an ensemble team um, which were sort of brought together uh, only because uh, this is a very low budget project. So we had to um, rely on sort of a lower skilled labor. Uh, at the same time, um, we sort of uh, responded to their skill set and we created uh, you know, designs that were sort of, um, which would incorporate the skill set of the, of the workers on site as well. What you see on the right side is um, an image from uh, an old building in Hyderabad, in the old city of Hyderabad, which is, um, you can see that it's, there is a little bridge that is going over the, um, over the street. So there's a lane and there's a bridge that, that connects um, two sides of the street. And I think you see this in old, uh, old Riyadh and old Jeddah as well. Um, here we call it a chatta or a damdama. Uh, and so it's a, it's a bridge that connects two parts or two uh, independent buildings. So we sort of um, wanted to uh, you know, replicate that in this building. We, we were able to do that by connecting one part of the, the building, which is a narrow part to the larger part of the building using bridges. And you can see that the rock sort of comes into the building. So the building embraces the rock and sometimes the rock embraces the building. <clears throat> and we also looked at the, the context, which is really colorful and kitschy, um, you know, uh, really brightly colored um, individual residences, which were uh, designed and built by the, by the owners themselves. Um, and all of these colors we wanted to incorporate into the school design. So we um, applied these colors in pops of color uh, throughout, you know, in a really restrained manner throughout the building, uh, in, the, in the doors, the windows, the skylight, um, the railings, um, and the staircase, and the gates. Uh, so you can see that it's a colorful school, but at the same time, you can see that the walls are uh, intentionally um, raw and blank. Uh, there are two reasons for this. One reason was that um, you know uh, when you when you enter the school, the facade or the elevation, we wanted to keep it really uh, subdued um, and sort of subtle because the rest of the the buildings in the neighborhood are really brightly colored. So as a school, we wanted it to sort of stand out as a public building. The second reason is that we wanted to um, keep the building really low maintenance. Uh, one is low cost because we're saving on the cost of uh, painting, but more importantly, the cost of maintaining the building. So as an architect, you need to think about not just the current um, you know, status of the, of the building when you hand over the project, but you also need to think about the future life of the building and how the users are going to interact with it and how the building is going to serve the people that it's meant to serve. So uh, in this case, because it's a charity school, we wanted to bring down the costs and we decided to keep uh, the walls unpainted and we had to really convince the, the client um, and, and the educational trust to do that. Um, but in the future, you can see that, you know, uh, even if the walls get dirty, they don't have to be painted again and they don't have to be, uh, you know, maintained as painted walls would have to be maintained. So um, that is the other reason why we kept it that way. Now, this is a conversation between me and the, uh, on WhatsApp uh, with the carpenter who was doing the, the uh, shelving system for the library. So as I mentioned, this is a really participatory kind of um, design process in which we also took inputs from the workers on site. So this is a, I was actually traveling while this was being um, fabricated. So these were some of the instructions that I gave. So we sort of decided the, the parameters. Uh, we decided that there would be a grid uh, for, the, for the shelving system and there would be certain um, sizes that were fixed. And the color scheme was fixed and the rest of it, um, you know, these are the rules that were given or the parameters that were given to the carpenter. And the rest of it, the carpenter had, um, full freedom to do whatever he wanted within those uh, parameters. And so this is what I would say we, co we collectively designed together in, um, in collaboration with the carpenter. Um, and the reason why this uh, library has steps in it is because everywhere, you know, when we started constructing this building, there were a lot of surprises all the time. So 
uh, as soon as we started excavating, we discovered more rock. And so it was difficult for us to build in cer certain places. So the plan had to be changed and the design kept evolving in response to uh, what was going on on site. So this was a more, um, it was kind of a design construction feedback loop that was happening. Uh, so for this particular space, we when we started to ex excavate, we discovered that there was this um, peak of the rock that was coming on in the space. So we almost lost the library. So we had to, um, you know, respond to that and redesign it in such a way that we have uh, an informal library. And we realized that, you know, the existence of a library, especially in a charity school where children might come from backgrounds where their parents are not educated. Um, so they don't have access to um, a lot of learning um, things like books uh, and other aids at home. So this was the, the school is the place, the only place where they can learn. Um, and so we decided that the library was a crucial part of the school. So uh, we created a step seating for the library, which is more of an informal kind of seating. And we also um, started a campaign, um, social media crowdfunding campaign called Make Progress Possible to collect. Uh, initially, it was to collect uh, books and um, you know used children's books for the library, but also educational toys and such. Uh, but over the years, every year during Ramadan, we run this campaign and we receive uh, donations from all over the world. Um, and, um, and so, you know, uh, we, we continue to have this uh, during the month of Ramadan every year. So this is a perforated wall that we created, which uh, brings in cool air from the north. And on top of that, so for a long time, as I said, the school was occupied while it was being constructed. Because um, you know, usually a building is not occupied when you're under construction, uh, but it ha so happened with this school because there was such a pressing need for space that as soon as one, uh, one or two classrooms would get built, they would start to be occupied and used by the students and the teachers. And that's how we were able to observe their uh, use of the space. And we were able to respond and redesign in such a way that um, you know, in response to their user behavior. Uh, so this was, uh, the skylight was one of the last things that happened. So before that, this was completely without a roof. So the rain would come in into the building and the children would play in the rain uh, inside the school building. And later we uh, built this as they raised funds because it was uh, built phase-wise or incrementally, uh, also depending on the funds that were available. Um, so as they raised funds for the, for the skylight, they uh, fabricated the skylight. The skylight was computationally designed um, <clears throat> in a geometric kind of uh, manner. And as I said, uh, we had really not very skilled uh, people working with us. So uh, we didn't create um, extensive uh, technical drawings, but actually just showed them uh, on, you know, on site directly uh, through verbal and, and sketch instructions. But also you can see this, this model here. So we created a, the model just like we do in the fractals workshop and in other uh, projects of ours, we created a 3D model and, uh, and that was much more easy for uh, the fabricator to understand as opposed to a drawing. So uh, he was able to uh, envision how that uh, skylight would look and then he measured and he uh, scaled up the, the skylight and that's how it looks now from the top. Uh, and that is the main source of uh, daylight that comes into the building and this is how it looks now. And this was completed in January, 2022, earlier this year. So this space, uh, the flooring and the completion of this last space was done earlier this year. So it took about um, five years or six years for this whole project to be completed. And the topmost floor is the smallest floor. And we also designed the logo. So um, as I said, we are an inter interdisciplinary design studio. So we design everything. So we designed the, stu the, the logo of the school and you can see that it kind of reminds you of the building itself because you have this, this ground and you have some part of it above and some part of it below, below the ground. And it's called Bright Horizon Academy, though we called it Hilltop School uh, before they gave it the name. These are a few before and after images from 2014. This is that large um, hall with partitions in it, which was a makeshift school. And this is in 2017. The students uh, started to use the, the classrooms that were built. This is the old building that was just, just a large hall. 
and the, the the teachers themselves have designed the interior of this and the and the exterior uh, following our color palette that we gave for the school uh, they applied the same colors so it's uh, a parametric design in that the parameters are set and they responded to it so it's a user designed building and this is the, the uh, kindergarten block nursery and kindergarten block this is how it was before construction. You can see the Golconda Fort in the background during construction, 2015 and over the years. And you can see that the students are still using the, they were using it while it was being constructed, but also sitting outdoors and still following the outdoor learning um, sort of method. And this is in 2020 when, uh, you know, schools were closed, so they were able to easily construct the rest of the uh, building on top. This is how the school situates itself in the greater context of the Golconda Fort. You can see the top of the fort um, there on top. That's how it is. And um, the school has become really popular in, um, you know, all over. Um, I think it's, it's quite well known uh, in architecture circles. So we have students from all over India, uh, different colleges and different, um, you know, different groups of architects who visit the school almost on a monthly basis. And it's also been featured on TV. Um, and so we have these guided tours to different groups of people throughout the year. Uh, during the lockdown, uh, we weren't able to do that, of course. So uh, I put a GoPro camera on my head and walked through the school, um, giving a, a kind of walk um, walkthrough uh, or a remote walkthrough of the school. And this was featured on Design, the virtual design festival. We were the only Indian firm to participate in that. And you can see that on the Design uh, YouTube channel as well. It's like a virtual walkthrough of the school. Uh, most recently, uh, we were um, the, the school design was published in uh, the uh, RIBA Rethink Design Guide, Architecture for a Post-Pandemic World, um, alongside many other projects, which uh, they felt were case studies for how architecture or schools should be designed after the pandemic. The school is also um, a silver rated green building certified by the Indian Green Building Council in 2018. We're working towards gold, hopefully platinum um, this year. And finally, um, we were also long listed for the Design Awards in 2020, uh, which is a, a great accolade uh, for uh, me personally, and of course our team as well. Um, being featured on the Architectural Association website. And uh, that's it. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you so much for an inspirational uh, webinar or lecture, uh, Architect Tikbir. Uh, we're going to take uh, about a minute to uh, take in the questions, and then we're going to proceed with the uh, uh, Q&A session. Okay, so we've uh, received a question uh, in reference to the uh, design process of the projects you take in. Uh, since much of the uh, project is based on the uh, community's uh, involvement or interaction uh, with uh, the design team, uh, how uh, challenging is it? And how do you uh, proceed to managing the, let's say, stakeholders uh, involved within the project when when a lot of it is based on feedback and uh, and not necessarily uh, liability or risk uh, because the users and end users they're not going to take in any of the risk in relation to uh, design or structural uh, stability of the building or any of that so how do you manage their uh, feedback uh, while giving them the product that they need and not take from the, uh, the, their, the design process. So uh, is this a question directed towards the um, Hilltop School in particular or generally about, about the design process? Well, I mean, it's, I, I believe it's directed towards your uh, approach to design. Okay. Because okay. You, you do tend to involve a lot of the uh, community in your projects, which is great to be honest. <laughs> I wish I wish many more projects could be oriented like that. 
But yes, proceed, carry on. Right. So we, I think we have the privilege of being able to uh, do that because um, a lot of, you know, uh, systems in India are still quite informal. So um, there, there are ways of sort of, uh, you know, uh, involving the users. For example, in the school, we have uh, user involvement um, because the, the final decision maker uh, for the project was the chairperson of, um, um, of, the, of the educational trust. And so we had uh, sort of the freedom that was given to us to be able to respond to certain things on site and, and um, uh, sort of uh, design or redesign based on that. So I think what's really important is one thing is, you know, you're defining your principles much before you um, start to execute or start to even design. So everything can be flexible and can change throughout the design process or throughout the uh, execution process, um, as long as your principles are intact. So the aim is to keep the principles the same, but the process uh, itself can, can be flexible and can involve. Um, the other thing is, of course, if you have um, a client that you're working for, uh, you need to have their trust and you need to have, uh, you need to be able to understand each other. So if the client, you're understanding the, the requirements, um, the client also needs to understand the, the design process. So as architects, I think um, a lot of us, you know, we don't, we don't tend to understand that we are experts in this particular field. And so it's really important that the client recognizes that as well. Um, when it comes to things like uh, you know standards, um, definitely there is a little bit of flexibility. When it comes to you know uh, the Indian context, we have certain uh, ways of responding. If you're working in Dubai, there are different ways of responding uh, to the projects that are going on. So uh, we obviously have to fulfill the criteria, but at the same time, I think um, what uh, is really interesting and really kind of exciting for us is having this participatory design process. And especially for the school, it was really uh, something that was non-negotiable because the site itself also became a participant in, in, the, in the design process. Because uh, once we designed everything and the structural design and everything was completed, when we, get, when we got on the site and we started to excavate, uh, we, had to re, we had to go back to the drawing board. There was no other uh, option, we had to redesign it. So I think um, it depends on project to project. But for projects like these, you know, we had to go back and we had to redesign. But at the same time, we're, um, the reason why we started Builderware is to have greater control over this part of the process, the construction process or the fabrication process. Understood. And it's, it's really a great cause to be working in such matter. And especially when it comes to uh, projects related to uh, uh, chari charitable work or uh, a third sector entities. Um, Architect Takbi, we would like to thank you on behalf of the architectural, uh, Archinet's team, sorry, uh, for your participation in uh, our design uh, talk series. And we look forward to your further cooperation with us. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. and. Um... I look forward to associating with ArcNext in the future as well. Inshallah, if God wills it. Inshallah. And I would like to thank the attendees for their uh, time and uh, for their participation with us as well. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Bye.